But uh, first, uh, uh, someone who many of you uh, from this community and this good dog would know well uh, is uh, Jess Balcalci. She was diagnosed with uh, rheumatoid arthritis in 2015. Uh, and I'm going to say no more and just let her pick up the story uh, in her own words. Yeah, so I was diagnosed with um, rheumatoid arthritis in 2015 and um, it was May, I think, roughly around May. And uh, I was actually quite devastated by the um, uh, diagnosis. And it actually started with sort of uh, very mild sy symptoms of joints aching, getting up in the morning, very stiff joints, hands really stiff, you know, unable to bend properly, but over, over the, uh, after about half an hour, I would be fine. So, so this carried on for a while, then I decided I should get it checked out, and it turned out I had RA, and the inflammatory markers were really high, and I was very, very upset about it, and went to see the consultants, and they said I have to go on medication. And so I started reading up on rheumatoid arthritis, if I didn't go on medication, what effects that would have. And also the medication itself, the side effects were horrendous. And I spoke to Sukhjit, and Sukhjit's always had uh, an interest in healthy living and the body, how it works, and you know, medication and all that. And he suggested that I go on this paleo diet, uh, which I did straight away. Uh, and uh, I went to my GP and I said, I do not want to take any medication. I'd like to do this through diet. And she was adamant that diet is not gonna work. So uh, again, I mean, if I didn't have Sukhji to back me up on this, I would have been on medication today. So I went back to Sukhji and he basically said, no, you've got to try this out. And Consult consultants were adamant that I go on medication and what they were saying was that uh, if I don't, my joints would be damaged and they would be, it would be irreversible. So that was quite scary. Uh, <clears throat> and I think uh, Professor Handa talking about value-based practice would have been quite useful you know, in my situation because uh, I really had to fight back <coughs> what the, um, the experts were suggesting. So um, so then I went on this diet and I said to them, I was quite adamant that I'm not going to take any medication. I had actually had one steroid injection at that point, but then I decided I wasn't going to go down that route. So um, I decided to go on this diet and I asked my GP that I wanted to be monitored over, the, over, an, over a number of months. And I was on this diet for six months and I went back for my tests and the inflammation was down by two thirds. So again, a uh, similar situation, consultants is again insisting that I have to take medication and they were saying your joints are gonna get damaged and that would be it. And uh, I said, it's fine, I'm gonna take the risk and I continued with my diet. And so in October, 2016, I was, actually cured. So my final test showed all my markers were normal <coughs> and uh, I was feeling great. You know, all the symptoms had gone. And I used to be, I used to get up in the morning with aches and pains, all of that was gone. I was feeling very, very energetic. And um, so, I mean, I think with this sort of thing, thing you need a lot of information and a lot of backup and one of the reasons why I could carry, the diet was very, very restrictive. And one of the reasons I could carry on with this diet was because I had lots of information. Uh, Sukhjit got me some books to read. Um, but they were basically on how to cure and reverse um, immune, immune, uh, autoimmune diseases. And um, just reading those actually gave me a lot of information about how the foods that you eat affect your body. And uh, so that also gave me a lot of comfort in, in you know, doing this for so many months. And the other thing was that um, the diet itself, it was a paleo diet, it was very restrictive. And I was actually, for 18 months, I did not cheat at all. I followed that diet to the book. 
And uh, I mean, I used to go to social functions and weddings. I used to take my own food and I would just take that out and eat it in front of everybody. You know, I mean, people used to look at me, but you know, it was fine. So, uh, and the other thing that we did was that uh, Sukjit told me to keep a log of what I was eating and I had to send him a photo of everything I was eating <laughs> every day. <laughs> so, uh, so I did that and uh, so one day I was really fed up with this diet. I came home and I, I loved um, uh, crunching up cornflakes. <laughs> so I poured these into a bowl and I stared at them. I think I must have stared at them about for about five minutes. <laughs> and then I put them back. I thought, yeah. no, I can't do this. <laughs> and then another time I'd been well into this diet and uh, everyone has, was having pizza around me and I was like, my mouth was watering and I thought, I really fancy that, mm -hmm. but I can't have it. And I took a photo of it and I sent it to Suki and I said, I'm sorry, but I caved in. <laughs> And he goes, no, you didn't do that. <laughs> but it was just a joke. <laughs> so anyway, so that's my story. Um, uh, I think that's about it. Yeah. And then uh, my final consultation, uh, when all the, all the tests were normal, my consult the consultant I saw finally was not my normal consultant and he looked at my results and everything and I said, I've just come to you know, get, uh, get your final opinion on this. And he actually said to me, you didn't have rheumatoid arthritis. And I, I just looked at him and I thought, you know, what am I supposed to say to that? And I said, all the, all the tests are there in front of you and I, all the markers are showing that, but he was, oh, you know, sometimes you can get these readings. He just, he just tried to pull me off. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that's my story. Thank you. Oh, um, so, um, thank you for that. The first question, in fact, was going to also be my question. How are you doing now, and uh, what, what diet are you taking now? Right. Um, so I continued my diet for quite a while after my final result but um, lately I have been caving in a lot and I don't think it's a good thing because I can actually feel it when I do eat bad food I can feel my body body's not liking it so I think at the moment it's about 80 20 80 I'm good 20 bad but um, I think I, sh I need to up it a bit but um, yeah so I think with something like that this is a lifestyle. Lifestyle. Once you get used to it, um, when I do cheat, I'm not sure I enjoy those foods that I mm. used to think these mm. are really nice. Mm. I don't actually enjoy them anymore. I eat them. And the funny thing is that with these foods that are bad for you, you have a little bit, and because you don't feel satisfied by it, you just keep having more because you think, oh, you know, I'll have a little bit more, and I, you know, it will be. I feel like I've had enough, but you know, you can continue eating, but you do not get the satisfaction. And with the good foods, I think in terms of quantity, you eat less as well, because your body's got its nutrition, so you don't need to keep eating. Any other questions? What was the diet you said? You said paleo diet, what does that mean? Yeah, so... So the question is, what is that diet? Yeah, so the paleo diet is actually, um, a, a diet that's sort of caveman's diet, really. So you cannot have things like uh, any of these grains or sugars or, you know, there's lots of limitations on it. And um, I'm a vegetarian, actually, so it was very hard for me because if you're a meat eater, then you, you can follow it easier. But um, then I, because I used to eat eggs and, uh, and then I started eating, eating fish as well. And my diet mainly consisted of fish, eggs, sweet potatoes, vegetables, and um, and that was it. And the other thing that actually I missed out was that Sukjit got me an appointment with a nutritionist. And when I went to see him, he basically said that you continue with the paleo diet. And he gave me some supplements as well, just to sort of help me along. And, um, and one thing, I think, you do need expert advice in, in anything you do because he, what I used to do when I first started was I used to start my day with a smoothie. I used to have, you know, just have whole fruits, you know, uh, 
blend them in Nutribullet and I used to have that for my breakfast. And he said, that's the worst thing you can do because you're starting your day with sugar and fruit is full of sugar. And he said, I have to limit my fruit as well to just um, apples, uh, one apple a day and berries and no mm -hmm. other fruits because the rest of them are very high in sugar. So yeah, so I think um, that's... that's so I was going to suggest we moved on to the other talks because there'll be some themes that will come together which should be common. Um, so I'm pleased to uh, introduce uh, Chitraj. Uh, he's a friend of Dilraj and he was diagnosed 10 years ago with ulcerative colitis and was put on, uh, or suggested in any case, to be on a very interesting set of treatments. So I'll leave it to the, uh, the place to start. Thank you. Um, hello everyone, my name is Chitraj. Uh, thanks to everyone for being here and thanks to everyone who's involved in organizing it from what I've seen so far It's really impressive and I'm impressed by how many people From different generations are taking an active interest in trying to look after themselves and improve themselves I think it's quite different to what would have happened even 20 years ago. So I think we're moving in a good direction um, I start with a disclaimer. I'm not a doctor or a medical professional. Sorry, mum <laughs> It's still time. Still time. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah, and it'll, they'll improve my marriage prospects, I think. Um, <laughs> so what I'm hoping to do is give you a brief whistle-stop tour of um, the story of the diagnosis of um, my condition, how it was initially managed, um, and how I went about doing my own research, and the implications that had on um, having my own, like basically running my own intervention and my own lifestyle. Um, and the impact that had on my health and then at the end share with you a few kind of like insights that I think I've gained from it that might be helpful to other people. Nothing that I'm saying is meant to replace the advice of a proper doctor because I'm not an expert and I'm sharing with you my anecdotal evidence and I think it's really good to maintain a degree of skepticism in everyone's mind so when you're hearing my story go back read up about it like um, Dilarad was saying before, don't just try and emulate it straight away because I'm different to each of you and so it might not be the right thing for you. That being said, you'll probably notice some common themes. Um, so about 10 years ago, I had um, gut-related gut problems, symptoms, lots of cramping, having to run to the bathroom quite often, a lot of fatigue, um, a lot of intense nausea and stuff like that. Um, and it took about three months for the doctors to diagnose with me with ulcerative colitis. It's something very similar to what I think your mum, Ajib, had. So I kind of feel like he's stolen my thunder a bit. <laughs> <laughs> he's, at, he's at base camp and I'm here. So, um, uh, but yes, yeah, so I was diagnosed with that. For those of you who don't know, it's basically where the final part of the gut, which is called the colon, becomes inflamed. And the doctors do various tests and they can't locate any virus, bacteria, no pathogen causing it. And so the theory is that all of these cases where that present themselves in this way um, is driven by an abnormal functioning of the immune system. Uh, basically a hyperactive response to a normal environment. Um, and so the way it's treated, initially for me, I was told, um, take this drug quite similar to ibuprofen and how it works, and that was called Asacol, and a second drug, which is a steroid, um, called prednisolone. And when I was told to take it, I was uh, 19, I think, and so I wasn't an expert, I just assumed the doctor knew best. And I wasn't really given a uh, rundown of the benefits that these drugs would have, how they're going to work, what the potential side effects could be. I basically thought they had a 100% safe risk profile. Um, I did used to read the leaflets and they would say things like one in 100,000, something like that. But I thought, no, look, the, doc the doctor's the person who's been educated, gone through 10 years of, of uh, studying, whatever. Uh, I can trust him. Um, and so I started taking them. I was fine within about two weeks. I felt well enough to return to university. Um, but then within about six months, the symptoms came back, and then some, so they came back very bad. Um, and I uh, put back onto the prednisolone steroids, and basically my body stopped responding to that drug. And the other drug I'd been put on, which I said was similar to ibuprofen, that no longer was effective either. Uh, so I went back in um, to be examined, and basically I just kept on getting worse and worse on a weekly basis. My weight went down to 49 kilos, which was terrifying, you know. I was hospitalized for some time uh, and eventually they put me on a new set of drugs called immunosuppressing medication and this is as far as I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, but these are basically drugs used to treat patients who have quite, so basically they have cancer 
uh, and it's used in chemotherapy. And one of the side effects of that drug in cancer patients is a poor immune system and poor immune response. And they're trying to take advantage of that side effect in patients who have autoimmune conditions like RA or like um, UC. Um, and so I was, on, I was put on that drug, azathioprine, uh, and within three weeks I started to get liver damage because of it. And I'd never been told I was going to get liver damage. And so I was getting something called drug-induced hepatitis. And credit where it's due, they monitored the liver, the, the liver test, and so they could tell me when the damage occurred. And um, they were able to catch it before it became too severe. Uh, and then he then shifted me off and said, OK, I'm going to try and put you onto another one called 6MP. And I thought, OK, fine, fair enough, something more complex. <laughs> and in between this time, um, my dad tried me on various herbal stuff, um, sort of Ayurvedic stuff as well. Uh, a whole, whole range of non-conventional treatments um, which unfortunately weren't successful and this is why I try and say nothing's going to replace that doctor. There is a role for acute medicine I think. Um, and so I eventually came back and still really low weight, still suffering a great deal, still on steroids and one of the impacts of being on steroids for so long is your chance of depression or serious mental health issues really, really does increase. Um, and so I was feeling really wrecked. I got put on to the 6MP drug and slowly, after two months, it started to have an impact, and I was really, really grateful. I started to put on weight again, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and basically, I thought this is it. Finally, this is going to work. Probably five years down the road, it's going to stop working. But by then, uh, the geniuses in your industry would have figured something else out, and I'll be okay. Um, and I tried to push it to the back of my mind, but I was dealing with the side effects. Um, I had a lot of exhaustion, really, really bad fatigue. And if you imagine the way that the drug I'm on works is by destroying the parts of your body that produce blood cells um, in the hope that you destroy enough white blood cells so that your immune response is reduced. They're also destroying a lot of red blood cells. Um, and that's what carries the oxygen and helps you metabolize and stay energetic. And so I was very low on energy. Um, often felt often fell unwell a lot more frequently than I used to because my immune system was reduced, um, had very bad nausea. And from the penicillin, I had persisting, even though I was off the drug, I had persisting um, elevated an anxiety. I have anxiety right now because of it. Um, and the mood, with penicillin, your mood is a lot more volatile, so you have those side effects that do persist. And I think those are linked to things like adrenal fatigue that it can take your body a really, really long time to come back from. Um, so I did have those side effects, and in terms of the research I did, so throughout this whole period, I'm a, my brain doesn't stop working, you know, every time I saw a doctor, I would maintain a log, I'd scan it in, I'd print, and then I don't know why, I printed it off again and stuck it somewhere else. It was my way of staying in control, and so I did a lot of research. Um, I've always been doing it, and I remember at the time of my diagnosis doing research, and my doctor's telling me explicitly, Diet might help people on an ad hoc basis. It might help you, it might help you deal with your condition. But there's no reason it's going to have a significant impact on you across the board. There's, there's no way that diet can affect uh, people in a, in a clinical way. It's more like just you've got a bit of IBS, you've got to figure out what works for you. Um, and so when I was doing research and I discovered people writing books, a good, a good one is one written by Mark Sisson called The Primal Blueprint. I don't know if anybody's heard of it, um, where he talks about things like the paleo diet. It felt like a very, very fringe idea, and it felt like um, this is never going to work. And looking at the dietary um, advice, it seemed like too drastic a thing. So I said, okay, no, that's not going to be for me. The way forward is the conventional medicine. But increasingly, I've been doing more and more research on it, and also it's become a bit more mainstream. People are more open to it. More people have done it. I met people who did it, and have said they've had good, good experiences. Um, and also, as we've been sharing more and more information, you can go onto a forum, type in your condition, see other people who've suffered from it, and the things that have helped them, and I noticed that there was a theme that this had helped them. Um, and weirdly enough, at the same time, I, about five, six months ago, um, whilst I'm doing my reading, and I, re I bought this book called Genius Foods by Max Lugovet, really, really recommend you guys read it. Um, and I basically developed very bad tonsillitis. I was off work for about a month, really, really bad, inflamed tonsils, couldn't drink, couldn't eat easily. I was in hospital for a couple of days on A&E with that as well. And they tested my liver enzymes again. And my liver enzymes have gone back up. And if you ask any doctor what you do when the liver enzymes go up, they say, stop all your medication. I don't want you to do anything. We don't know what's causing it. And basically, we don't want to blow your liver up um, by trying to fix something else. And so I stopped the medication that was apparently keeping my gut problem at bay. So this was a bit frightening. But I just finished reading this book, and I thought, you know what? Why not try 
this diet. And so I began this diet, um, and in a nutshell, it's a lot more nuanced than this, but to try and briefly explain, basically no grains, no starchy vegetables, no sugars, limited sugary fruits, lots of fish, I feel bad saying this in the Gurdwara, <laughs> lots of egg, chicken, and grass-fed pork, lamb, and beef. <laughs> it's really bad. <laughs> and it's basically that, a paleo. So I, I basically live my diet like I kind of think, what would a hunter-gatherer have done you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago? If he would have eaten the food, I eat it. If he wouldn't have, I wouldn't have eaten it. Oh, also, and this is good, I don't drink any alcohol, so I, I think I've uh, got a bit of balance there. <laughs> um, and that was four months ago. And since then, I've, so about two weeks ago, it's very, very recent, uh, I went to have a full checkup um, with a gastro specialist, and they did the full uh, colonoscopy, which I won't talk about because it's not a good experience. Um, and uh, I think three days ago, I got the results. And basically, there's no active inflammation in my gut. Um, there's no evidence of historical inflammation, so there's no chronic scarring. All of the risks are just constantly told, like your risk of bowel cancer is higher, your risk of other complications is higher. Um, all of those risks have returned to baseline, and I literally found this out three days ago, and I didn't know how to respond. She basically said, don't, you don't need to go on any drugs. Enjoy yourself. Um, um, and I brought my mum along with, with me to the appointment, and she's always been there, like when I was in hospital and everything, and she basically just couldn't believe it either. She wanted to be here today. I don't know where she is. She's not. She's not in Everest. <laughs> she's somewhere. She's somewhere else. Um, I think oh, she's taking my granny to another appointment. My granny's not up for eating beef yet, so I can't get her. I can't get her out to my <laughs> um, But yeah, so that's my journey. And in terms of the insights that I gained, and I don't want to offend any doctors in the room, but doctors aren't the ultimate source of knowledge on health. They don't know everything. They're very, very well, expertly trained in their fields, but they don't know everything. And I think in some areas and sometimes, not, not so much now, but if you look at 30, 40 years ago, there was a time when the doctor would tell you smoking does not adversely impact your health. And now people are literally coughing up lungs because of um, smoking cigarettes. Um, and I think it's because we tend to think of the medical industry as something different, as though there's, in, you know, inherent within it, there's goodness which isn't anywhere else. But doctors are people, pharmaceutical companies are companies, and they're vulnerable to the same incentives of trying to make profits, and they should be. That's how you get the drugs that help people in very, very desperate situations. Um, but what this means is that in the short term, say you're, I don't know, a person's had a bad accident, or me, for example, when I was really at my worst with colitis, your priorities, your agenda, what's important for you, is closely aligned with what's important for the drug company, because they need you to survive in order to give them money, and you need to survive in order to be happy. Right? So your interests are closely aligned. And so they tend to be very effective, I think, in acute situations. Even though the steroids caused me problems over the long term, the short term, they really did help bring things under control. Um, but in the long term, if you think about it, anyone who produces drugs wants you to need to buy drugs. I mean, if, has anyone seen The Wire? Right? And even illegal drug dealers want to hook yeah. you on for life, yeah, right? So there's, there's no difference. It, you'd, rather, <laughs> you'd rather have a cash flow long-term certainty than fix someone and then have to develop the uncertainty of having to develop a new cure for something mm. else. Um, so this doesn't mean, I've made this a separate point, it doesn't mean that drugs don't have an important role. They really do. But when it comes to the long-term, that's when you need to start asking yourself, what do I want to do? And what does this essentially mean? And I've thought about this a lot, and I think it means you cannot outsource your personal responsibility to look after yourself. There isn't a single other person, I believe, in, on this planet who cares more about your health than you, who's more driven to look after their health than you. Um, and what's important then is you need to, or what I recommend is people becoming more and more informed about the different options which are available to them. Understand a bit more about, okay, this is the advice I'm getting from person A. Person A's had this experience. Person B is telling me something different, but now it's up to me to make this choice about what I think is right for me. Uh, the doctor feeds into this, but you have to make the final decision. Um, and the final insight I wanted to share is when I was doing this research, and maybe you guys can test, uh, testify to this as well, um, although it's never been easier to share information, you know, on the internet, on Facebook, on Instagram, books, whatever, the area of nutritional research and trying to educate yourself on it, it's a minefield. You know, you, 
one one week chocolate is going to save your life the next week is going to kill you tomorrow um, you know red wine apparently is going to be really good for your heart but uh, it might give you cancer so try not to have that um, and if you, this is what put me off is because people used to say Chit Raj you need a balanced diet and I'd think well, well balance just what does that mean balanced does that mean I have mostly carbs or does it mean I have hardly any carbs um, so it's really important to go slowly educate yourself um, be open minded and like it's been mentioned like it's been mentioned lots of times already just go if you're going to make a drastic change to your diet do it with somebody so you're getting that counterweight to what you're thinking um, yeah thank you very much for listening appreciate it. any questions from the audience i had the doctors react three days ago um so the question was, how did the doctors react three days ago? <laughs> so this is actually a new gastro doctor I went to see. Um, the previous doctor I went to see, he really didn't get along with me that well. Um, so what happened is, a while ago, about, I think, four years ago, I went travelling. And when I went travelling, I stopped taking my immunosuppressant medication because I was going to Southeast Asia. And I thought, look, if I get something out there, I don't want to be immunocompromised in a country where I might not speak the language of the, of the medical um, professionals, etc. So I stopped taking it, and I was fine. And I came back and I thought, hey, well, hang on a minute, I've been fine, maybe I should stay off of it. I stayed off of it, and then the flare-up, the colitis re-emerged, it became active again. And I went to see the doctor, and I had to come clean and say, I haven't had it for like five months. Right. And the first question he asked me is, are you suicidal? <laughs> and I thought, he, I thought he was being serious, and I thought, oh, no, I was feeling quite low, but I said, no, hope for me, because I didn't feel comfortable opening up. And his words were, um, you might as well have been. And I thought, Jesus Christ, I was like, don't you guys have to take an oath or something? <laughs> don't you guys have to say you're going to look after your patients? <laughs> and so, yeah, so that's the experience I had with him. Um, and then he really wanted me to have another colonoscopy, but I really was put off that because the last time I had it, they don't know why, but I, w I came to after the sedation with a part of my retina being permanently damaged, which means that part, if I were to close one eye, I've got a black patch somewhere where I can't see um, and I've only got two eyes right and so and so I said I'm not taking this risk he kept on saying oh, it's very unlikely it's going to happen again I said yeah for you <laughs> you can afford to live in the world of stats I'm a person and so um, yeah I kept on putting it off I kept on booking it and then because the only way around it was to have it unsedated uh, and so I kept on putting it off like booking it and then getting really nervous before and cancelling it and so he, I eventually got a call from his secretary saying I've been discharged uh, dishonorably, probably. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, so I was discharged. And um, I then took it upon myself. I said, I'm going to do my own research. I'm going to find myself a, a doctor that I think I like. And I did find one, and she seems really good so far. I told her from the outset, I've not been on medication since I had this tonsillitis. I really don't want to go back onto it. Let's check it out. And she checked it out. And her words were, if you hadn't told me you had colitis, I would never, ever have known. So it, it, felt, it felt like a miracle to me at the time. I did have it on sedated, though, and it was very, very, very crazy. Um, and I carry pictures around <laughs> on my phone just to remind myself. Um, and uh, she was very positive, And she told me, she was careful, though, to be cautious and say, look, it's a disease which we know does come back at times, and you can go into remission. And she's right. It, I could, you know, tomorrow, you know, God forbid, I could have problems. Um, and she told me, but there are these options. And she said that to me. And I said, I understand why you do have to say that. But genuinely, I have to tell you that I, I optimistically feel I'll never, ever have to be on any medication for this again. And I believe it. Not because I think, not because I want to be cocky or arrogant, but because this experience, I mean, it's not just the colitis. I mean, my energy levels have got higher. I lost 10 kilos of weight in three months. You know, I've, um, I sleep a lot better. My allergies have got become reduced and so it's invigorated my belief that there's so much capacity within you already to be able to look after your health that um, you literally have no idea the, of the benefits you might have in the next week as long as you continue to look after yourself um, so yeah so she was really perceptive to that and she shook my hand and yeah it was really nice so, so, the, so the question is you've noticed increase in your energy levels but what about the mental state and is that linked in any way so definitely hundred um, percent I think when my when your energy levels are lower you're more liable to have a lower mood you're more liable to basically fall into a cycle of depression where you feel demotivated you don't go to the gym because you don't exercise you don't get the endorphin rush that would have saved you and therefore you continue to spiral lower 
Um, I don't have any uh, post-food crashes. Uh, my hunger's completely different. How I feel hunger was different to how I felt it before. Before, if I felt hunger, I couldn't think. Like, you know, I didn't care if my mum was trying to tell me something really important. I'd just nod and reach, <laughs> reach for the chapati and have the, have the sag, you know. Um, but now I have hunger. I, so basically I can fast for a day and I don't feel any hunger by the end of it. It's, it's remarkable. And the thing is, it sounds woo-woo when I say it, but I'm not the only person saying it. And I guarantee you try it for about, uh, most people try it for a month within three weeks. You'll see a difference. Um, for the first one week, I would say my mood was negatively affected because I suddenly, from you know, I went cold turkey. I stopped having any grains, no rice, no flour, um, no corn flour even. Um, no sweet potato, I was very restrictive and the body's basically saying what the hell is going on here uh, so for the first week it was difficult but I did keep it I kept kind of a mood diary to monitor how it went and then for the second week I started to notice improvements you know I could wake up at 7 o'clock and within 10 minutes not have that grogginess go to the gym and I have felt a greater level of resilience with respect to my anxiety but that's going to be more difficult because I was so last April I was in a really really tough place really difficult place um, to the extent I went to see the psychiatrist and he said, uh, he listened to me for an hour and he goes, this is probably the worst case of anxiety I've seen in about two years. And I said, mate, you don't want to say that to someone suffering from anxiety. So keep, keep it a secret and tell me when I'm better. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but he, he is really supportive actually of this journey because uh, I've told him I want to be medicine free as well. And he's really supportive. He said, give yourself time, be patient. But yes, the, the journey has been very helpful. And actually there's a podcast I listened to recently if anyone's got Spotify, um, listen to the Genius Life podcast. And there's an episode with a psychiatrist talking about how you can eat an optimal diet for your mental health. Uh, and there's a lot of helpful information, I think, in that that can really help you maintain sustainable um, good mental health. So we're probably going to move on because yeah. we're still going to hear from Amit and then we'll have a bit more time for questions. So Amit doesn't really need any introduction after earlier this morning. Uh, he's the founder of the Resilience uh, uh, Foundation. Factor. Factor. Uh, and uh, he's going to start with um, the crash that he was telling you about, I think. Thank you. I just want to say fantastic lumber today as well. It's delicious. And so it crashes. <laughs> it's not crashing out. And there you go. Proof is in the pudding. So to speak. So, look, in 98, I obviously had the uh, car accident, and being a young 20-year-old, uh, <coughs> I didn't really worry about mental or emotional health. You just sort of, um, you got patched up, sent home, and you have a long time to sort of think about different aspects of your life. And I'm not going to bore you with the detail, but already having lots of thoughts going through my mind, and who I am, what am I going to do, my life's sort of over, to the fact that I was very lucky that I was sitting next to a 27-year-old person at university who was a um, who was studying science and we had overlap of subjects and he basically said, I think I can help you because I, I put on about 15 or 16 kilos. I looked like rubbish. Um, I just felt really sort of lonely and alone even though I had a lot of friends and I just wasn't moving around. So he sort of helped rehabilitate me because one of the things they said was you can't, your body's had so much trauma that you're so inflamed in your joints um, and your lower limbs and your thoracic is really... Because I have also had stress fractures in my back from being a fast bowler that you're not to do anything. And there was, a, there was a big philosophy back then that exercise creates um, more inflammation if you had trauma and don't... And, you know, when you've got a back injury, you've got to rest. So I'm 20, I really didn't care too much about myself. So I took that advice. And I'm sitting next to Phil Gowan, and Phil said to me, you're an idiot. <laughs> Tomorrow, I'm taking you to the gym. And he started that. On, and, we, and we didn't really do a lot of gym work back then, playing um, sports. It was a lot of athletically running, a lot of um, cricket ball skills, a lot of fastball, different things. But we did a little bit of gym work. So he took me through the pace. I think the first day I cried after the session like you wouldn't believe. And he, we really didn't do a lot. And he basically said, if you don't, if you don't continue moving, by the time you get to 30, if you make it, you're going to be a broken guy. Do you want to have kids and be able to bend down and pick them up? And all these sorts of things he was sort of putting through my head. And I'm glad he did it. It was a lot of tough love. But the first thing he did was get my nutrition right. And, you know, I used to eat a lot of chapatis as well, I'll be honest with you, I confess. <laughs> um, 
So it was like looking at the diet, looking at what we can eat. I really didn't go on a paleo diet. There was no such thing back then. It was he was a bodybuilder, so basically we looked at healthy, um, healthy fats. You know, carbs to eat. Timing was crucial, and obviously it was only one protein source. And it was a lot of tuna. I can tell you, cans. It's like horrendous, but. So within six months, I've lost, lost the weight. I've gone back in to see the orthopedic surgeon. Now, with the type of trauma that I suffered, where I had split my lower, lower limbs, I had um, bone marrow issues, I had a whole heap of different types of trauma, very inflamed bones, because I basically took the brunt of, of the thing and my, my chair had broken off and left the vehicle. Um, they were calling my name in the area where people are sitting in wheelchairs. And I'm standing around the corner next to him and he kept calling my name. And obviously, Amit Oberoi is a quite a quite a quite a distinctive name when everyone's John Smith. <laughs> and so I walked up and said, "Some surgeon, hi." He literally looked at me twice. He was standing. I've just read the file. Can we talk? So I talked, and I, I I told him. I said to him, "This is what I've been doing." He same thing. It's like I don't believe you. Whatever, carry on. Great someone I don't have to operate on. I'm not really interested in you because I don't have any, I'm not gonna be, be doing an ACL or a PCL operation on your knee now. I'm not gonna be doing any work with you, so, so, so see you later. So that all sort of went away and I was told I wasn't allowed to contact sports. My brother was um, playing in the Australian Football League and he, I said, I made a pact with him. I said, look, if you don't make it in the majors, um, I'll come back and play a bit of football with you. And he looked at me like, you're crazy. like. Are you going to do it? So anyway, fast forward, he sort of, he left, and, um, he got cut from the team and he was a bit down and out. So I said, let's go back and play amateur football for our old private school. And, you know, I played two seasons after that. It was amazing. Um, so now I still have a very, very vigorous regime and exercise and so forth. But what the tragic thing is, the trauma that I suffered uh, mentally and emotionally will probably never leave me. And I, I talk about this openly that I moved to Sydney and it's a different, I lived in Melbourne, I moved to Sydney and people drive like maniacs. I was in a, um, a three series BMW with my family and my wife was pregnant with number three. And this guy sideswiped us and I had an anxiety attack. Literally, I could see in the rear vision mirror this car coming up, he's gonna hit us, what can, where can I go? And I tell you, BMW is a great car to be in because when I had like, <laughs> it was a Honda City and it was, there was no protection. <laughs> And I just, I couldn't breathe. I was having heart palpitations, um, speech slurred, no saliva, blurred vision. It was like the episode of 98 came back and my wife's looking at me and I'm trying to, you know, you're, you're a man and you're a wannabe a man's man and you, you don't want to say to your wife, like, I'm losing it. So we got back home. I went in the bathroom, I just cried. I just thought, wow, <clears throat> something's really going on here. So I reached out to an old professor of mine who did a lot of biofeedback, so there's heart rate variability, and he said, look, these are things you can work on. And so I started working on that and getting back into meditation and, and talking about these things. Then getting into the neurofeedback in a big way. And that started to help me really accept a lot of things that was going on behind this. And I still think it will be there, but it's about managing that. So I do a lot of exercise in the morning, first thing. So that's really helped me. That's, so a foundation block for me is exercise. I used to train sort of 4.30, 5.30, 6 o'clock before the kids would get up. I've just now moved that to 1.30, 2 o'clock. Um, so I've changed it since coming back to the UK. So it sort of doesn't fit in with what I'm doing. But exercise is the foundation. Get the blood moving. Get all that happening. Do some meditation. Get the, all the way, I always eat well. Um, it's been my birthday um, this week, so I had a few pieces of birthday cake. <laughs> Extend out the fasting. <laughs> But I generally don't have, I generally have, every day's the same for me. I get up at the same time every day. I stick to the same routines. Yes, I'm very boring, but that helps me. That routine really helps. So I've just come back from Dubai, same thing. Travelling with a, uh, a colleague of mine, I said, right, we'll be getting up. We get to the airport, at, at, we get to the hotel at 3 a.m. in the morning, sleep for a couple of hours, we go to the gym. And he's like, oh, please join me. If you don't want to join, you can stay in your room. And that just keeps things happening. So get the routines happening, build up the resilience. You know, we're all carrying traumas of some sort. Some, you may never totally remove them from your life, but you can build up your resilience to it and you can build up your strength. And that's basically um, what I've been doing.
Shall we come back to you first, sir? Yeah, I had a question. Uh, uh, you mentioned about uh, so drug induced uh, hepatitis B affecting the liver. Mm. Was, uh, did it affect you or your liver? Or so the question is, did the drug induced liver dysfunction affect your liver in the long term? Oh. Um, I don't think so. I think they caught it early enough, so by removing the drug from my system, the liver was able to heal itself. But I think that's why they wanted to, so I was having blood tests twice a day when I was in hospital, um, because they know if, if they let this happen and they don't catch it or they wait for there to be a really drastic physical symptom, it becomes irreversible, I think. Um, so fortunately, thank God, and even uh, I've got confirmation two days ago that my liver enzymes have returned to normal, so I don't think there's any long-term impact. Thanks. Any other questions from the audience? Search. So my uh, question is to Andrew. So it seems that, I noticed that there's usually the men a moment when the penny drops. And it's like, there are things building up until that moment. And then that's when you're like, take off. Like, when was that moment? It sounds like it might have been when you had the interaction with your body or the friend, but when was the switch? When did the light bulb kind of turn on? I, th I think the moment happened when I sat next to Phil and, I, and he said, you don't look well. And I said, oh, I've just been involved in a car accident, and I should be dead. And he said, no, you're not well. And that's probably when the penny dropped. And maybe the car accident was the best thing that ever happened. I, I still, I'm living and breathing, for example, right? Second chance. So that probably was the penny drop then. But I think what we have to do is we have all have to face our own fears. And I said this earlier, because if we don't, it just bubbles up and underlying, and it'll pop up when you least expect it. And, you know, I've got three children and I'm a mentor to many other people, so I, I wouldn't want them to um, be living in silence as well. So that's why I guess I'm here today as well. But it's, yeah, face your fears, be honest with yourself. At the end of the day, if you're not honest with yourself, your body will come back with full vengeance, trust me. And you don't want that to happen. So, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Chips, you've got a question as well. Yeah, thanks, thanks for sharing your story, Yannick. Um, so how have you found, because you mentioned that the mental and the emotional side of your experience has been particularly challenging, how have you found you dealing with that has impacted your relationships with the people around you, your, your, your friends, your family, your children? How, have you found, because you've gone through this, you're able to discuss it more openly or less openly with your family? It's a really good question. I always um, have my uh, heart on my sleeve. So some people find that a bit strange when they're talking to me um, because I'm very open about it. I always wanted a, a family. So when we lived in Australia, it was just my brother and I, and we felt very isolated. So I said, no, I need to work on aspects of my life. If I'm gonna, if I'm gonna be in a relationship with someone else, they're gonna bring baggage. I'm gonna bring baggage, right? Mm -hmm. But if we're gonna have children, we wanna raise them with the right values. And, so, and I don't want them to be, you know, worrisome and so forth. So my mum was very a worrying person, so that probably rubbed off for me mm. massively. And for me, it's about identifying what the, the, the root cause is and, and trying very hard to to establish ways to to rectify those root causes because I see my children. So we arrived here just before Christmas and we were walking down Bond Street and my son, who's seven, has got very high EQ, emotional intelligence, and he said to me, Dad, the first time I've ever seen you happy you fit in isn't it an amazing feeling I just I just burst out in, in tears I, 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 I never cry I can tell you now I've got my hands stuck in a car door a few years back and I didn't cry okay and this seven year old kid made me cry and I just said to my wife and she said well you know the proof is in the pudding you are happy and that's because you know they can see that and they can see that you know I'm addressing these things because I used to just push it away you've got to be distracted this strong role model, this male role model, you've got to hide all those things. We, I've got to be Superman. But the Superman had kryptonite, right? Yeah. So don't let your health be the kryptonite to your life, is what I'm saying. There's a tagline. We should. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting a tattoo. No, no. <laughs> but yeah, it's a, that, that's a great question. Thank you. Still that. Right. So just building on what next question was. So if there's like tends to be a point where you have a switch. But, you know, say people in this room don't have a switch right now, maybe maybe their concern isn't really, have, it doesn't have a strong enough feeling, an immediate feeling right now, that they need to act on it. 
How, what are your thoughts on, like, all, like, for all of you, what are your thoughts on how do you really get in touch with those feelings about what you really want? Is there a way for people who don't have those immediate concerns to really draw on that motivation somehow? I don't want to hug the mic, but I love it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think you, everyone needs to write a scorecard. So just get a piece of paper, find some quiet time, and just write one or two things that you want to achieve for the rest of this year and then for next, for 2019. So again, coming back to it, being a sportsman, we used to have scorecards and everyone in your team would see how well you performed. If you be honest about it, you can achieve greatness for yourself by saying, right, I'm going to do this today. Even though you, your health might be fine, but it might be just small little elements. It might be, oh, I just want to do 10, I want to have 10 minute, 10 minute walk around the block each day. Write that down as a goal. And that will challenge yourself and be honest with yourself. Don't don't cheat yourself is basically where you need to start. And then we, we're hoping it's preventative today as opposed to going through something because th that's why I found the resilience factor. I've gone through something that I wish I never went through. But I've learned the lesson. If I didn't learn the lesson from this, then what, what would have been the point, really? So bear that in mind. Um, so I think... At its heart, it's a question about motivation. So, um, if you're not feeling that turn that um, turning point factor, which triggers that motivation, what do what would I say? Um, so, so my researching and actually putting into practice what I think is a healthy lifestyle for me that was part of a wider trajectory that was on. But I was starting to rediscover the stuff that I actually enjoy. I found myself in a place about a couple of years ago where I didn't really get much fun from life. I would go to work, work late, come back eat food, um, go to sleep, or watch Netflix and binge or something, or for some reason, when I'm doing nothing, go through my Facebook or my Instagram to try and see what everybody else is doing. Um, and so I, sl I started in a very slow way, similar to what Amit said, the baby steps. Uh, somebody asked me, my therapist said to me actually, uh, what did you, you used to do as a kid that you loved, that you don't do anymore? And I, I straight away I thought, badminton, I haven't pl I played that in ages. And I hadn't played in 10 years and I just started going badminton again. And one of the things you'll notice is bit by bit, your general sense of happiness in life starts to increase once you reintroduce these things that you've stopped doing um, as you've grown up because you've started to say, oh no, I'm a grown up, you know, I have to start looking at property prices and, and things like that. <laughs> um, and rent yields, yeah. So, so, that's, so reintroducing those things kind of, um, if you like, re start to refill that tank of motivation and happiness about life. And before you know it, it's like a, it's a rising tide and you start to think, do you know what, I do want to take care of myself. You know, I don't want to be out of breath every time I climb up these stairs quickly or um, I do want to do what I can to prevent myself from having to go into statins or metformin or something when I'm older. Uh, and when you start to get those ideas, you're a lot more willing to jump in and see what it's about. But yeah, baby steps. Um, start small and be very, very, very kind to yourself. It's not hard, it's not easy, sorry, trying to um, make a difference in lifestyle habits that you've had for donkeys. Uh, so, yeah, that's my advice. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, um, so for me, um, I had no idea what the alternative approach would have been. So, uh, just because Sukjit was the one who, who led me down this path, I'm very grateful for that. And I just think that the easy option usually is just to go for the medication because, you know, you, you pop the pill and you could carry on as normal. But um, I think the prospects of having this disease and, you know, I've seen people with the, the disease and the joints and, you know, how it affected the joints and how, you know, they were struggling with it. So that was my main motivation to stick with this diet and, and, and carry on. And I, and I think that you have to be very, very patient with any, any of these approaches. You need a lot of patience and you cannot expect a fix in a week or so. And, um, and, and they do work. There, there are lots of people who tell you, you know, what are you doing is not going to work. You know, along the way, I had lots of that. Just have a little bit of this. It's not going to do anything. You know, just have it. It doesn't, you know, the motivation needs to come from within you. It's what you want to achieve at the end of it. And I didn't want to be, you know, a disabled in 10 years' time, and, you know, just being, you know, on walk, walking streets or wheelchair or whatever. So having done this, now I just feel that 
you know, anything, any other uh, issues that I have in my life, I will always look at the alternatives and see, and I'm sure a majority of them can be treated through the alternative route. And um, uh, so medication drugs are not the answer always. Uh, you know, maybe in some cases, yeah, but not always. Um, okay, well, I'm not going to answer your question. <laughs> to me. Uh, you wouldn't expect me to as one of your former tutors. Um, <laughs> what, what, but, but I'm also conscious of time. Uh, so I just wanted to sum up this session, which is to, to start by saying that you know, you, you've heard or we've heard three stories which are extraordinary events, but actually extraordinary people, and I want you to thank them for that. So there were some common themes, I think, between the stories, but they're about people deciding what's important to them uh, and hence back to uh, their values. Uh, but it's also about people taking responsibility and control of their own health. Um, I was giving a lecture on Wednesday morning to the Masters in Clinical Immunology at uh, Oxford University. And this was to a group from a very wide background who were interested in immunology. And one of the things I was telling them was that the whole of the GI tract, your gut, is lined with millions and millions and cells of lymphoid tissue, immune system, because that's the part of our body where we're vulnerable. We're letting ourselves be vulnerable to ingesting all this external stuff. And the body knows to protect you, it's got to have this protective system there, but we're still putting stuff in to test it or to poison ourselves. So think about that. There is a scientific background to this too, and that's called a gut-associated lymphoid tissue, GALT. So today was very stimulating for me personally, I hope it's stimulating for you, and inspirational to me listening to the stories and the stuff about food. Uh, and, and I have ambition after today to be one of Dylan Such's stories next time, and a uh, turning point for me uh, today, because when you look at me, I did say to Dylan, are you really sure you want me to be part of this project? Because I'm not looking like your ideal candidate. Um, <laughs> And he said, well, well, there's hope even for you. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but what I hope you've got is some strategies from today, including ideas about good food and good food habits, about resilience and biofeedback, about self-control and determination, uh, and about empowering you in shared decision-making in your interactions when you need them with, with healthcare. Uh, we certainly, I think, have a lot to learn from people who just don't follow the rules. These are the guys who don't follow the rules, and, and that hence the term, the outliers. Uh, and, and certainly for me, in any case, lots and lots of, uh, dare I say, use the pun, food for thought, uh, but much more importantly, uh, many more thoughts about food. Thank you.